All right, so let's talk about the roles, the companies, the employers in the industry of HVAC and places that you might fit in. So you may have seen these guys before. These are the architects. And the architects have been hired by the owner. Let's see, where's the owner? He's over here. All right. So the owner may or may not be looking for someone with our particular skill set. And the reality is most of the people who probably go to work for the owner directly are either going to be in more of a service tech role or they're probably going to be somebody who's experienced in one of these other roles. This guy worked with them, they enjoyed working with them, and now they brought them onto their staff. You know, if they're buying a bunch of buildings or building a bunch of buildings, he might want somebody uh, on his staff to help with that. All right, let's talk about architects because these are a place that you can go look for jobs right now. If you've ever uh, referred to yourself as a creative, architects might be a, a good place to look. So some of them will look like this and some of them will look more like this. And I've got a cheat sheet that goes along with this video and it's going to give you some, uh, some websites and some examples and some places, some names in these industries that you can go check out. You can go check out their websites and see, kind of get a feel for whether they're this guy or whether they're this guy. So if you want to be an actual architect, you have to go to architecture school. That is a two to five year process, right? So I say two to five years because it's whether you do it as kind of your undergrad or you could do it as a master's program, but regardless, it's a lot of classes and then it's a lot of studio time and actually building things, right? So if you're interested in that, do it. But if you're not interested in architecture school or not interested in architect school yet, if you have some CAD experience or if you, uh, heck, even some architecture firms will hire mechanical engineers so they have them in staff because they will need them. But if you look on architect firms, uh, they do a lot of 3D modeling and they're also interacting with 3D models from the various engineers. And so they need somebody who have that CAD, uh, Revit, BIM skill set. CAD, BIM, Revit, CAD, Revit, BIM. Those are things that I can't even say, obviously. But CAD is three-dimensional computer-aided drafting. It's been around for a long, long time, and it's two-dimensional. And so you see, you know, you make a set of drawings with everything kind of on top of each other, and, and you just look at it, and then you can see a side view. BIM, or Revit, uh, Revit is a, is a company that makes the software, but everybody just calls it like a BIM object. Uh, it's building information management, or um, Revit is a company that makes the software. Anyway, 3D modeling. So you can see there's a pipe going here, and there's a duct going here, and they're going to run into each other, and you can work that out. You can have the different disciplines talk about it before you build the building. It's way easier to go ahead and plan that stuff in advance. But you have to have people to do all that work. And there's a lot of people who are currently in the industry who don't know that new software and they don't really want to go learn it. And so sometimes they'll be hiring younger people who are interested in that uh, and they'll just let them do the drawing. They'll do the big idea stuff with their experience and then they'll let other guys do the drawing. All right, engineers. We talked about engineers in my other video and we're looking for MEP engineering firms. That is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering firms. So if you're mechanically minded, if you're a mechanical engineer, an industrial engineer, or maybe even an aerospace engineer, the mechanical and the plumbing are, are up your alley, right? So it's thermodynamics, it's fluid dynamics, it's statics and dynamics. Um, those classes will be relevant in this. And the roles that you can look at there are, again, your BIM, BIM, that'd actually be like that, Revit, or uh, CAD guys. So modeling guys, these don't have to be engineers, right? And then when you come here, you're talking about an entry-level engineering job would be, you would have to have, generally you would have to have some sort of engineering degree. Usually how it works is you come in as the, the low guy on the totem pole, you usually work in a team, you'll have a low guy, middle guy, and a high guy. 
high guys, usually more business development kind of things, big ideas, weird questions. And then he has his team that, that does more of the grunt work. So sometimes that young guy will come in and he'll actually be doing all the, the CAD modeling. Sometimes there'll be a group of CAD modelers and a young engineer would kind of jump right into the design side of things. So MEP firms. Now, if there, there's two ways that we can go to market with a job, and that is D, B, or plan spec. If it's a design build job, which is what DB means, this is your team that you start off with. So the owner, the architect, the engineer, and contractors are pre-selected and they design and they build the building all as a team. Sometimes contractors will have engineers on staff that help them with that and sometimes they will have a contract with an engineer and they'll work as a team together. But that's pre-selected. The other way that it can go is a plan and spec. Plan and spec means that these guys are going to put a set of drawings and a, a set of specs, which is a thick document with words about all the things that spells out. It shall be this thickness and this type of fan and, and all those things. It'll be like a book about how the building is going to be constructed. Plans, specs. And what they do with that plans and specs is they put it out on the street. And that means that a bunch of contractors will look at it. They will put prices together and they'll get prices from all of their subcontractors, which would be the guy with the bulldozer, the guy with the electrical license, the guy with the mechanical license. And they'll put all of that, the structural guy, the crane guy, all of those will come together. He will put a number together and then he will submit it to this and sometimes low price wins, sometimes most complete package wins, sometimes good experience in the past wins. But that's the bidding process and that's how it works. Contractors, general contractors and subcontractors, particularly mechanical subcontractors, sometimes we'll have a mechanical engineer on staff to help with weird problems and to help with this design build don't necessarily have to be a professional engineer to be hired in one of those. Um, just somebody that's engineering minded and can help them put a plan together, a good plan, do project management stuff. All right, this would be a good opportunity to mention the PE, which is a professional engineer. That's going to be a thing that you'll see. If you've graduated with a mechanical engineering degree or an industrial engineering degree, something like that, you can take the FE before you graduate from school. The FE is the initial entrance, and then you have to have four years working under a professional engineer before you can take the test to become a professional engineer. This would be a good, working in a firm would be a good opportunity to do that because you'd be working on a team and you would be working closely with guys who could sign the paperwork and uh, say they had worked with you. So if professional engineer is a goal, um, this would be a good thing. As a contractor, you may or may not have an opportunity to work directly with a mechanical engineer, which is part of the, or with a professional engineer, which is part of the requirement. All right, so there's the contractor. And then let's talk about manufacturers. So a lot of times people think of the sales guy with the manufacturer, but with the manufacturers, we've got two sides of it. We've got the manufacturing side. And so that would be if you're into manufacturing and you like factories, you like designing things and building um, uh, machines or components or something like that, all the manufacturers need people who do that stuff. They also need research and development guys who are more in the theoretical and, and kind of out there thinking. They also need people who understand how their equipment works and can relate it in a sales role, so like a sales support role. So not actively going out and selling, but when somebody calls and says, hey, my unit isn't working and I don't know why, they need somebody that can answer the phone and, and can deal with that. And so if you like people, that could be a good opportunity for you there. The other side is the sales force. So uh, I, I like the guy in the shark car, and I feel like a lot of people think sales guys are like sharks, right? So there's that. But sales guys are often going to be working with an engineer, and they're going to be trying to get their equipment laid out on a set of plans. So whether it's a design build or a plan spec, they want their product named 
on the drawings, which is going to make it easier for them to sell it in the future. So he works with them, and then when these guys are trying to get prices, he wants to give them pricing to and work there. The sales guy's role should really be to be a trusted advisor and to be the guy that they call when they have a weird problem or they need help with something. And he also needs to be a problem solver. So if those are things that are interesting to you and you like being out there, if teaching a class about a piece of equipment seems fun to you, then, uh, then sales might be an opportunity.